Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Melinda. Welcome to another episode of We Need to Talk. This week, we have something special for you. We had a live panel discussion at Harmony Toluca Lake in Toluca Lake, California, about the church, LGBT inclusion, and being a Christian in 2019. So take a listen to this great panel discussion, and Carmel and I will be back with a new episode of We Need to Talk next week. All right, so we're going to dive into a really needed conversation, I think, that we need to have in 2019. And this first question I want to hear from all of you, so we can we have a few mics so you can share. And then as we go into different questions, just whoever wants to speak up, please feel free to do so. So my first question is, the definition of being a Christian has changed over the years. So in 2019, what does being a Christian mean to you? Just like really easy to start it off. <laughs> A professional at work. Um, <laughs> does anyone want to start off? Or I feel like you have. I feel to like, say. The pastor, like you're like yeah. you're like ready. Uh, no, I'm yeah. Just it's my lower back. No, um, <laughs> no. I guess I'll I guess I'll start. For me, doing the work that I do as a writer, many people are coming to me without any barriers, and they're saying, um, you know, I have this experience of Christianity. And then I have my personal spirituality, and there's a tension between those two. So for me, being a Christian means not caring at all about those labels anymore, not uh, caring about necessarily who gets the credit or what building I'm associated with, but really just being in the lives of other people. Uh, I think that's what Jesus did so organically and beautifully, and um, I'm sort of I try to be a story learner. And the more you get in the lives of other people and hear their stories, um, naturally, your compassion is going to rise up in those things. So that's that's usually where I begin. I think it, for me, it, it's like a two, <clears throat> two-fold question because it's what does it mean to be a Christian to most people and what does it mean to be a Christian to me? Because those two things are very different. I find that in this day and age, you have to, it's like a, like at work or whatever, it's like I have to come out as a Christian because it's now Christian is synonymous with um, judgmental, not, you know, be with just people that think that they're right and everyone else is wrong and they hate the gays. And I mean, that's what Christianity has become synonymous with in mainstream. So I have, so that's obviously not what it means to me, what it means, but also what, what being a Christian means to me has also changed quite a bit over the years as I've grown in my own faith and grown and, and discovered who I am and what this world actually needs, the kind of Christianity that the world actually needs, not what I was particularly raised with. Can you repeat the question? Because I want to make sure I respond to this just exactly. In 2019, what does being a Christian mean to you? But the first part of that, you said that it has changed. The definition of a Christian has changed over the years. Yeah. So in 2019, what does a, being a Christian well, first, mean to you? I want to challenge that, first of all, that the idea has changed. Um, being a Christian is a constant evolution, mm -hmm. I think. But I don't think it's actually changed. Who Christ was uh, in the life that he lived could never change. So to be a Christian, you try to live your life according to the life of Jesus Christ. So that is a constant, right? Um, how that message has been portrayed over the years maybe has changed. But Jesus Christ, his message has not and cannot change. Um, so for me, being a Christian now, I'm finally at an age where I'm comfortable in my faith, where I'm comfortable uh, calling myself a Christian and having these sorts of conversations publicly. And since I've been doing that, my life has blossomed, you know? And to me, being a Christian is simply just leading with love and compassion, um, trying to make every decision throughout the day as close to what I think Jesus would have done, you know? Um, and Part of that, a big part of that, if you're a uh, any sort of minority group within the faith, part of that is ignoring people, <laughs> right? Like Christ is in all of us, so there's something in each of you that, that you know that's good for me and vice versa. However, it's not all true. So for me, being a Christian now is just reminding myself daily to make good choices, live my life according to the life of Jesus Christ, lead with love and compassion accept what is true from others and you can always you can always tell what's true if it's based in if it's grounded in love 
and then also being strong enough to build a barrier and reject some things that are not true. And that's a tricky line sometimes. It's easy for the line to get blurred and for you to get pulled into conversations and pulled into arguments uh, and defend things that, that maybe hurt you. But it's, it's, it's now I think it's easier than ever and more difficult than ever to sort of take a stance and just ground yourself in that truth. And so the more you can do that, I think, the more you can evolve and grow as a Christian. And that, that is what being a Christian is to me now. It's a very complicated answer that made no sense. I hope you all got something from it. Grace? Well, I'll make my answer a little shorter, but it's really kind of the gist of what you were explaining, is that uh, for me, being a Christian um, has and will always be following Christ's example to the best of my ability, um, which to me means radical love, acceptance, and compassion, uh, even beyond things that might seem reasonable um, or fair. So that, that is what being a Christian is to me. Tennessee? Um, yeah, the first thing I kind of picked up on that was being a Christian in 2019. And what's interesting for me at least is me being a Christian in 2019 is the same as me being a Christian in 2005 because my faith came from my relationship with God. My faith came from the teachings of my grandfather, of my mother, of, you know, my grandfather used to say that the purpose in life is to leave the world better than you found it. Um, he never said you are going to hell if, he never said like you, must be perfect in order to, it was always do the best that you can for others and leave the world better than you found it. So that's what I lived by. Um, I left the church. I left my faith behind in 2005, 2006. And it wasn't until two years ago that I actually reclaimed my faith, that I reclaimed my relationship with God. And it was still founded upon the same principles, which is leave the world better than you found it, uh, show compassion, show kindness through love, we can make the world a better place. And so my Christianity, my faith, is the same in 2019 as it's always been. So we talk about love and compassion and acceptance, which are the core values in Jesus' ministry. So why do we think that those messages get lost when it comes to the LGBTQ community? I'll, I'll take this one to start. Um, I think it has a lot to do with probably the reasons I left. Uh, I came out when I was 15 years old, and I was excommunicated from my church. Um, the pastor actually showed up at my parents' house and basically demanded that they respond to my public display of sin. And... It was through that where I felt so uncomfortable being a part of something that was constantly telling me that I didn't belong, that I couldn't belong. And we tend to do that. We tend to forget the parts of the Bible that say, like, love thy neighbor. It doesn't say love thy neighbor as long as they are the same as you. It doesn't say, you know love them as long as they're not gay or as long as they're not Muslim or as long as they're not another denomination. It says love thy neighbor. Yeah, and, and I would just say also, I think more specifically to that, it's the um, vast majority's interpretation of about six verses, right? And so it's six verses that have been very rigidly interpreted um, and we sort of take that as like, this is the universal truth of the Christian faith. And unfortunately, you know, there's this bizarre consensus that all biblical schol scholars have agreed to that, and it's just not true, and there is more research and other interpretations and translations out there. And for other topics, we seek those out. And unfortunately, with regards to this topic, I think it is in our human nature to be exclusive, which is unfortunate, and that's sort of something that we should workshop within ourselves. Um, but we need to do that same work that we do on other issues to go out and find those other interpretations, those other translations, that research that is comprehensive, that is out there um, from well-respected biblical scholars um, about those six verses. You know, it, it's unfortunate that we hinge 
uh, so much of how we exclude an entire community of God's children uh, on the interpretation of some. John, I'm wondering if, oh, sorry, I just want to go to John real quick. Could you talk a little bit about that? Just, you are the pastor. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Well, I, you know, when we've been talking, we originally all spoke and we said things about compassion and love. But most people that we're talking about have a Christianity that is filtered through the lens of fear. And so when you're taught, when the pastors design the things that they instruct their people to do and believe are based around otherizing, that is always going to weaponize their, their Jesus, right? And so I think um, they don't weaponize verses about um, divorce because they know that their congregations are half filled with people who are divorced. So it's usually taking the most marginalized, vulnerable community and put, lifting that up as the greatest threat. So that's what we see in Christianity right now. It's taking those people who are most in danger and most under duress and saying that's, the, that's who you need to be afraid of. And it's, it's toxic. Yeah. I think something really interesting about <clears throat> the Christian, Christian community in, uh, in North America and I think it's probably pervasive everywhere, is that it's, A, what you were saying, it's not standing for something, it's standing against something. There's, they feel more powerful and united standing against a group, a marginalized group. And B, the, the narrative of um, victim, victimization. Um, there's a lot, they love to, it's, we're all, Christians are always being persecuted. Cha you know, Starbucks changing their hot latte cups is an attack on Christianity. Everything is, everything is an attack. And so they, they pick this community, this LGBT community, and they can say, that's why we're following. It's the Muslims that the reason that we're so attacked. It's the, it's, so it's, that, it's Christianity has become a, a, a label for what you stand against, not what you stand for, I think. Absolutely. And I also feel like there is definitely, and this could be a, year-long discussion. There's a political element to it. Certain politicians over the years and certain political parties have used it to divide the country and to, and to make people retreat into corners, it, them versus us, the mentality, but also even deeper than that. And we see this in study after study. The more we start to understand sexuality, um, there is a more fluid, there's a fluidity to what sexuality actually is. And we were always taught that it was this or that. Straight, gay, you know, um, and nothing in between. And truth be told, that we're all somewhere on the spectrum. I'm about 90, yeah, the Kinsey scale. I'm about 97% gay, probably, <laughs> to be honest. Um, there's 2%, ladies. There's, there's, there's a couple. There's 2% out there. So you're saying there's Who's going to be the lucky one? <laughs> but but I, I think that I believe that we've been raised, we've created a society Three percent. So. Yeah, you're, I, was, I didn't want to call him out. I was like, math. Math, math works math. differently where I come yeah. from. It was this like, is not a panel on numbers. There's apparently. a one percent margin of error. Ninety-nine percent. That That's my world's nightmare. Um, but I believe it's it's it was probably a wise choice at one point to sort of create these divisions, and until recently, and you see it's very different in younger generations. My sister's 22 years old, graduated from college yesterday. And in her friend, she's, she's a Christian. She goes to, she ministers at a camp every summer. And she didn't grow up Christian. This sort of happened recently. And uh, with her friends, so many of her friends are sexually fluid, which to me is kind of confusing. I'm 38. And I'm like, huh? And I kind of judged it a little bit at first. But now I'm like, oh, no, that's actually kind of beautiful. Like, you're actually just attracted to the person, right? And that has how, that's how we're all created, how we've always been. But we haven't started to have conversations about that until very, very recently. We like to put people in boxes and say, you're either straight or you're gay. And we judge people if they say they're bi. Because we're like, come on, pick one, right? So it's easy to, to make people fear something that they don't understand, especially when there might be 2 or 3 or 20% of that in themselves. Because everybody in this room at some point in their life has probably had a question about something. Why did that person, why was I feeling a certain way around this person? Why did that person make me a little bit nervous or anxious or angry or kind of like put a little pep in my step? It doesn't mean you're gay or you're not straight or whatever, but we are connected and created in a way that's more diverse than what we've 
accepted up until just recently when we started to have these conversations about sexuality. So I think that you can, you can scare a lot of people by saying, you know what, that's bad. Because most people can say there's probably, whether they're aware of it or not, even if they're not cognizant of it, there's something inside themselves that resonates with that fear. Yeah, and I would just say furthermore, I think it's part of the human condition to find a group to other, unfortunately. And I think that's why Jesus was so explicit in his terms of like, I tell you this, love thy neighbor as you love your, there were no conditions on that, right? As you love yourself. And I, and I, I think that something that was really uh, revelatory for me was when someone um, through just like reading was like, you know, if you're not loving yourself, and I know this is I, RuPaul, I hear it, but like, if you aren't, I hear it, but like, if you aren't truly, if I only was able to come to have a personal relationship with Jesus when I started loving myself as God created me to be, years of rejecting how I wanted to dress and present, years of repression, and it was only when I started loving myself that I was able to love those around me better without condition because I wasn't placing those same conditions on myself. So I think that it is unfortunate. We, we are, it's part of our, you know, our sinful nature. We want to other, we want to exclude. It makes us feel secure in a warped way. But Jesus, we have to remember, called us to just forget about that. Forget about those divisions. That is, that is manly. There is fallacy in that. This is of man. We need to get better at just loving each other, stop with the, the full stop. There was no condition on that. Well, I think there's a, real quick, there's a theological laziness because when you, most of the people, uh, the, the clobber verses for me were my gateway into faith deconstruction, right? Who has time for an existential crisis? But when you actually, when you ask people to read those verses and say, here's what they actually say, here's what they actually mean, and they have to let go of a long held prejudice all of a sudden they have to examine everything around it. And so most people don't want to do the work. And so they'd rather just take that shorthand hatred and go with that. I think because, not well, not just Christianity, but any kind of religion like legalists that are fundamentalists that are like at their core, they're more concerned with being right and, and having what they grew up knowing to be right than ever compromising anything else. You know what I mean? Like their their, their being right is their salvation. Is if they lose if they lose that, they lose in their minds they're losing their salvation because they're questioning God, they're questioning his will, they're questioning all these things that they were taught. Do not question. The Bible said it, that's it. You know what I mean? So in in them in the in you having them confront that, you're confronting their their fear of losing their salvation. That's where they that's the only the, the only thing that I can remember from being on that side. Um, so there was some research done that indicated specifically millennials just don't go to church anymore. And I'm curious to know your thoughts on why you think that is and how much you think the, uh, the doctrines about LGBT community plays into the lack of churchgoers within that age range. Please. <laughs> okay, As a millennial. I love this. I, mentioned, I alluded to it a little bit ago with my sister. I actually believe that wholeheartedly that millennials are so godly and so Christ-like, they don't have a label for it yet necessarily, and maybe they're not going to church, but I really believe in this generation. And they get a bad rap often, but I believe that they're actually more connected to Christ than generations before. They just don't quite realize it yet. And I don't think that's necessarily a terrible thing. I, I always try to tell people, look, I believe in Christ, but I also spent 15 years borderline atheist. I was brought back to Christ by my boyfriend um, six years ago, whose father is a Methodist pastor. And we went to church because of the clobber passages, because his father was sending him pretty hurtful emails daily because he was really struggling. And so we decided to start to go to church to make his parents feel better. And I came back to Christ through my love of a man. And our faith has only grown deeper and deeper through our relationship with each other. And I'm a better person for it. And I, I hope he is as well. <laughs> He's a much better man than I am. But I believe this younger generation is innately connected to Christ in ways that we sometimes wish we could be because they don't have the messiness of the church getting in the way. Because the church and religion oftentimes blur it all. I, it made me step away for 15 years. I was raised Catholic. And so stepping back in, it was hard for me, and it still is hard for me sometimes, to fully lean into my faith because I have such a history of hurt and damage that has happened to me through religion over the years, this younger generation doesn't have that. When my sister started working with the church, she was 17 or 18 years old. She didn't grow up in, in the church. 
and she was all in. And she's the most loving, compassionate person I know. And I think so much of that is because she didn't have the negative history of the church. So it might actually be a blessing in disguise. So what do you think it is about the word church that scares people? You, anybody can answer that, honestly. I think it's all the damage that was done in the name of that church. You know what I mean? And all, there was so much. M millennials weren't raised for the world that we, that we have inherited. The, the, what, the, 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 what we were raised with was, was previous generations' notions of what life is. And that, the scope of things now is so completely different that, like, church is, is, uh, sounds like and echoes what we were raised with, which isn't helping us at all in, the, in today and age and the way the society works now, the way that, that, that our humanity is, is evolving now. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit because that model doesn't fit. And I'm sure we'll get into, in, into other questions later on, but the church is also not going to fit in the world the way it's changing unless it's willing to change with it. And I don't mean the message. Like, the, you, know, like you said, Christ's message is, is eternal, and it's, and it's unchanging, and, it's, and it's, we veered off of it and come back and veered off and come back as a, as a, human, as a species. But the way that the world is, is going now, if we, we associate church with what we knew which didn't work, you know. And, and I would say also, I think that, you know, millennials were sort of a skeptical generation because we've had search engines and the internet at our fingertips forever. So we, uh, I think we sour um, to a lot of the hypocrisy that we see within the church because that's stuff that we can Google. People can share their experiences. If you're a queer person who's attended a church and you've been treated otherwise or um, there, there's been inequality within your church community, you can share that to make sure that the other, you know, another person, a queer person of faith will know, oh, I'm, I'm not going to go there. And so we have access to that in ways where I think before the church was able to sort of, um, the church at large was able to sort of save face and sort of cover things up and, and tidy things away. And I, I think it is a little bit of that hypocrisy that a lot of millennials sour to, especially because um, it sounds like, you're, you know, what you're talking about with your sister, the um, allyship is very strong within the younger generation um, because people are feeling more free to come out. And so you have these interpersonal relationships, which I do feel are huge um, in just making inroads of acceptance uh, and compassion. And so people are just, they aren't willing to put up with institutions that are oppressive in any regard. And so, and yeah, and that are hypocritical. So I think that the younger generation is like, I don't wanna be a part of that because this is bogus. <laughs> they have access to information that we never had access to growing up. So now, when you see that Chick-fil-A is donating millions of dollars to stop gay marriage in California, millennials are like, that doesn't seem right, that's weird. No way, I'm not going to Chick-fil-A anymore. Or when you see, like, you know that the Catholic Church has billions of dollars that they would use to maintain a system as opposed to helping those in need oftentimes. And they do a lot of great work, but I was raised in the Catholic Church, and it's, it's, ugh. Um, and then also you see things like you see things like all these churches in the South, you know, black churches predominantly getting burnt to the ground and not getting any media coverage. But then you see Notre Dame and all of a sudden there's hundreds of billions of dollars donated in a matter of hours. That's absurd. Like collectively, we have to be like, that's not OK. Younger people see that they see that and they're willing to do something about that. And without social media. Now those churches are now going to be rebuilt because the money has been raised in the South. But it wasn't. Like before social media, that stuff wouldn't have happened. That level of activism wasn't capable. We weren't capable of it. And younger people, they know how to use social media to make change. And that, that is the, the beauty of it. And I think that's how we are different generationally, which I think is a good thing. Um, yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is obviously we know why millennials are leaving the church, all of these reasons, everything we've discussed so far. I think the challenge is figuring out how to bring them back. Um, I think a lot of us left the church because of the hate, because of being ostracized, condemned. Um, I left out of anger. I was very angry because I was so um, participatory in church and it meant so much to me. So when I left, I just didn't want to be a part of it. And it wasn't until returning that I realized it's very similar to politics, right? If you're not happy with the current, um, and the current government, then you have to vote 
you have to actively participate in democracy to change things. Very similar with church, very similar with our faith. If we want to change things, then we have to participate. We have to actively reach out to the younger generation, let them know this is different from what you may have read online from the churches that you probably grew up in. We are different. Our message is different. What we're trying to do for religion as a whole, this is different. We're getting back to the message of God, not the political um, translation of what the Bible has become to control people for whatever reason. So it's up to us to participate and reach out to these young people and show them a new way of faith. Yeah, I think related to that, I, you're using this definition of millennials are leaving the church, but we don't really probably agree on even what the church is because they're leaving a building on Sunday, but they're still engaged in their world and they're being led by their faith convictions to do activism and to do beautiful work. Uh, you know, I was sharing with Melinda yesterday, my readership on the blog goes up exponentially on Sundays because there are millions of people who have that muscle memory and they're, and they're asking questions and they're doing all that work on that day. They're just not counted in all these in all our buildings. So the church is actually doing what the church as the body of Christ has always done. We may just have to um, change along with it. So uh, John, we talked about a little bit yesterday as well during uh, your talk at Hollywood about you know making the table, welcoming everybody to the table, but also showing grace and love to those that don't show grace and love to us. So being a part of the LGBT community, how do you, for those of you that are, how do you show grace and love to those that don't show grace and love to you? <laughs> well, you start by introducing yourself. I'm Grace. Um, and, well, I'm, and I'm going to add a, a second part to that, especially with, and sorry to get political, but with the current administration and what is being showcased nationally. How do you continue to show grace and love to people that don't show grace and love to you? I, I, I think for me, and I think this is something that I, I'm sure we all sort of wrestle with, and there are days when you feel like you're doing it better than others, and that's normal, and that's okay. Uh, for me, I really do try and sort of meet people where they are and recognize that I'm meeting with another image bearer, and I also understand that for a lot of people that I disagree with, they're having, I'm, I'm asking them to do that same work that they're having to do to me. I'm a tattooed lesbian. I understand that this might be a, a, a different thing than that what they're used to. And, and I, I think that I have, um, speaking of tattoos, I break bread tattooed on, on my wrist. And all I think I can really ask of someone else that I disagree with is just to really seriously, just meet me at the table wherever we're meeting in this busy, insane world. And if we can really just try and, and see the good in each other that is inherently there, I believe that is God given. And, and just try and block out all the, the, the stuff of, of human nature that is set to divide us, that is sinful, that isn't important when it all boils down, um, then I, I really do believe that we can break bread with even those we fundamentally disagree with. And um, it's something that is very important to me. Um, and I... Uh, I, that, that's all I can offer. It, it's, and I know that that's not really anything practical. I don't know if I have necessarily any practical tips. Maybe someone else does. But just sort of setting aside any expectation for how the conversation is going to go. Uh, putting us, I'm not an argumentative person because I'm just so sensitive. Um, so that I do feel like I kind of have that. Like I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm, I'm just going to hear you out. If I disagree, I, 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 I'm going to do my best to sort of hear where you're coming from and understand that you have a lived experience. And I'm just asking you to understand that I do too. And that we're, we're both you know, valid here, but sometimes you, you might be wrong, and I'm, I hope that, <laughs> I hope we can get through it, okay? Life is hard. Anyone? I, I think one thing, too, um, when we're speaking about people who are different from us, right, it's important to find the similarities. So, what was fascinating for me was that when I identified only as spiritual, there were conversations I absolutely could not have with my father because he saw me as non-Christian and different. And because I wasn't Christian, I couldn't have those same conversations because I was already outside of his box. When I came back into the faith, he had to find other reasons why we couldn't have that conversation. And slowly that door started opening a little bit because I would point out, well, no, Dad, like... 
I'm also Christian. We believe the same thing. We just have different interpretations. And maybe because I found that connection, that similarity, all of a sudden it was a little bit easier to have those difficult conversations with him. Yeah, the, the art of listening has been lost by many through hurt and pain and other experiences. Um, and I think if we could just listen to each other a little bit more, um, Queen Oprah once said that after <laughs> doing her talk show for, I think, what, 25 years or 30, whatever, however long she did it, she said that there was one common question that almost every guest asked her after, whether it was, you know, just a school teacher or Barack Obama. They always ask, how did I do afterwards? Um, because they just, they, they just, they wanted to make sure they were, they were being heard and they were being seen and that they got their point across, whatever that point may be. And so as a television host, I always try to think of, okay, what is this, what am I trying to do? What space am I trying to create right now with this person I'm interviewing? It might be a celebrity, but it's no different than talking to a fellow parishioner or somebody off the street, right? You need to create a safe space for that person to share. You need to be open to like listening to them and hearing what they're saying, because we're all hurt, but we all want to be heard, right? And as Christians, sometimes we have to, whether we think that we are so right and they are so wrong, it doesn't matter. You're never going to get somewhere with somebody, because my entire family is like diehard Christians from Ohio. They're all Republicans. They're all Trump supporters, Hello. and that hurts me sometimes, because I'm like, look, look at the words. You can see it's on video. That's hate. This administration is trying to take my rights away. How can you? You're my godfather. You held me, or you were there with my baptism. Like, how? And I've had to let go of so much of that the last few years, especially, and just learn to just listen because people are scared, regardless of how they vote or where they go to church or who they, you know, associate with. People are hurting, and I know what it's like to be hurt because I used to be a different person until I came back to faith. And so now part of being a Christian is being able to rise above that, humble yourself, show some grace, and just listen to people and allow them to share. And you don't have to take it all in. You don't have to accept this truth. You don't have to let it, like, open old wounds and hurt you. But you can just let, you know, let them talk. Just listen. Well, I know. Go ahead. No, I, you probably have way better no, things I to say than I do. No, I know. I know. <laughs> no, I would just... Um, going to say that everyone, we all have a story that we tell ourselves about why we believe what we believe. And no one ever thinks they're getting it wrong. And most people who are discriminating don't realize they are discriminating. They have a voice in their head or an idea of God and God is desiring them to do it. You know, I talked yesterday about meeting Southern Baptist sign guy, being with a lesbian teenager and, and, and saying, how can we see that he's doing exactly what we're trying to do right now? He's trying to hear the voice of God and respond to the voice of God and do what he, he's supposed to do in faith. Now, we may see it as toxic and damaging, but in his mind, he doesn't understand that. He sees that beautiful impulse to follow God, and so we can at least meet people there and begin to try to learn the story that they tell themselves. That's That would be my response to that question is, what is that person actually, like, if, if, if that person were talking to Jesus, what would Jesus be actually listening to? What is, what, what is somebody that wears a, a MAGA hat what, what do they actually believe? They feel threatened. Their world is changing. They're, they, they're starting to feel irrelevant. They're starting to feel like they're going to be forgotten. They're starting to... So that's what, that's what all of that racism, what all of that homophobia... It's all... It's, it's like, I don't, want, I don't want to disappear. I don't want people that look and think like me to disappear. I don't want to become irrelevant. I don't want to become the thing that I've stood against for so many... You know what I mean? So if you start to look at the humanity... In what their what their actual struggle is, you can you can you can see grace in it. You can see grace in, 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 in how you can communicate with them and how you can say there's room for both of us. And I think it ties back into I think your last question or maybe two questions ago about bringing people like millennials back to church. I think that that's maybe not necessarily the way to do it. I think we need to focus on bringing the church to the community, which is what it should have been doing all along, anyways. I, I we get so caught up in this idea of we need X amount of butts and seats, really, pardon my, but, but, but that's not necessarily what needs to happen. I think getting outside of the church and going to where the people, because if, 
we always talk about my old church I used to go to, and I, I've switched. I'm, I'm in a new church for the last couple years, and I love it. Um, but my old church, they always would, would preach about getting, reaching young people and bringing young people out into the back. But then all of a sudden their ministry started, started to dissipate, and they didn't actually like it when people went out into the community and tried to do work. And that was really, really frustrating. Because that's where, and they always say, if Jesus, Jesus stepped into human history to wash us free of our sins and all these, this, this verbiage they would always use. And I always said, like, if Jesus stepped back into human history right now, if Jesus decided to come here right now, where would Jesus be? Jesus With wouldn't the gays. be in the church. Yeah, he'd be in West Hollywood. With the gays. Like, right? Or he would be down on Skid Row. Or he would be some, in, another, in a community where he's needed. He or she is needed, I'm just saying. But, but. <laughs> Instead, we, we get so focused on being inside the church and focused on that as opposed to going out into communities where Christ is actually needed and where he would go if he came back. Yeah, I, I, I totally just want to echo that and say that, you know, we get caught up. This whole panel is basically based off of the six verses that people will throw at you with regards to the LGBT plus community. And how many countless verses are there about serving those less fortunate, those who have been disenfranchised, those who have been othered, marginalized. And the focus yet is on the six to ostracize. So um, I, I think that's a, just a great point. And I think that you, just to remind everyone that um, the you are four times more likely as a trans woman to die of homicide. And I don't see a lot of outreach from Christian communities to help that group. And I, I don't understand why. It makes absolutely no sense in my brain. And I wanna say, like, it's interesting, because a few years ago I couldn't talk about my faith publicly. I was kind of coming back to it. I was a little bit nervous about it. I was, and I'm on television. And there's this idea, this misconception, that if you're in Hollywood, you can't talk about it. It's not true. I've brought it up in so many interviews where major, major celebrities are thrilled to talk about their faith. And I made a choice a couple of months ago. I was uh, doing the Wendy Williams show. She was out dealing with some stuff, and I was filling in hosting some episodes for her. And we were talking about the Jussie Smollett story, right? And we'd been talking about that story for weeks. It was everywhere. And... My thought process was, because I, I, we have friends in common, we've been in the same circles, and if he was telling the truth, um, if he was actually telling the truth and that did happen, I didn't want to be piling on when he wasn't feeling heard. If he was lying and it didn't actually happen, that means he's already in a broken place where I didn't want to then pile on and hurt him even further. Mm -hmm. So speaking to your point, I decided that day to make a decision to talk about something different. And I did some more research, and one of the one of the stats was that that trans youth are four times more likely um, to commit homicide, or and also just LGBTQ youth in general are five times more likely to attempt suicide by the age of 18, and also it was something like 80 percent of uh, Black LGBTQ youth feel unsafe in their own homes, mm -hmm. and I started to have that conversation on camera in front of millions of people, and I just went with it, and it was terrifying, and it was scary. And I talked about my boyfriend, who is a person of color, and our relationship, and how we have faith. And I kid you not, that day, this is so, this is so millennial of me. I'm definitely not a millennial. I got like 3,500 Instagram followers that day. That day. And I had so many people reach out, uh, black gay men in particular, thanking me. Because I felt, is it okay for me to talk about this? Because this is not exactly me. Am I, am I qualified to talk about this? But if I don't, who will and who can? And I had a platform in that moment, so I talked about it. And the response has been overwhelming. Whenever I post anything on social media regarding my sexuality and my faith is when my numbers skyrocket every time. There is a deep, deep desire for these conversations out there. And there are spaces to have these conversations, even if it feels, because when you start to feel like, uh, maybe not, maybe not, that's when you should. That's when you lean in. That's what faith is. That's when you take that step and you just have the conversation. And you'll be amazed by, like, what it could lead to. I want to piggyback off of that a little bit because a few of you are in the arts. And I love that you said that you, people think that you, you shouldn't talk about your faith. It's just, as I'm sure, coming out for you guys and being in the arts in that sense, it might have been a little scary. So now it's kind of a twofold thing. So being a part of the LGBT community and being a Christian in the arts, how has the response been for you guys? It's been great for my career. <laughs> it's helpful. That's what, I, that's what I was talking about in this day and age, that you have to kind of like, to be in the people and to uh, 
admit that you're Christian is like you have to come out and say, I'm Christian, but I'm not what you think. I'm, it's not like that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to clobber you with verses and preach, you know, brimst, fire and brimstone. This is, that's not my version of Christianity. And it's, um, and it's up to me to live that to be that, to be the change. And, and that's intrinsically just being me, to learn how that, how that is me being human, being having the, the, the human experience, having compassion, having the anger, having the everything that comes with being human, allowing myself to feel those things, and then owning up to, the, to when I was wrong about something, when I misstepped, when I misspoke, when I didn't act out of love, when I acted out of fear, being big enough to admit that and to, to atone and to try to make it right and ask forgiveness, that's, that's to me, that's what being a, a Christian is now. Um, but it's hard to explain that when, when, the, when, that, when that banner gets waved and they're like, oh, you, you stand, what, do you walk in the parade or do you, are, are you one of the people holding the signs that say gays are going to hell? Like, because there's, it's either or, there's no, there's no in between. At least there hasn't been up until, you know, people like him use their platform to talk about. Yeah, I mean, for me, as I mentioned, I only recently in the last two years returned to my faith. And I was 28 years old when I sat in a room for the first time where it was actually Reverend Kathy who, in her sermon, said, you know, everyone is welcome here, which I had heard before, but not in the way that she presented it. She then called out all of the fringe groups LGBT, of people of color, um, our Muslim brothers and sisters, she identified everyone that was welcome. And it was the first time in my life that I had ever sat in a church where someone specifically said, you, you are welcome. And over the last two years, it's been a process because I went from denying something so much saying that I didn't want to be a part of it, that I was excommunicated and had no place there to now being in a position where, you know, two years ago I asked God how now that I'm back on my feet, I want to use my voice. I want to use my craft to honor you. Give me the opportunity to do that. And in the last five or six months, multiple occasions have arisen where I've been given opportunity to do that. Um, you know, HUMC allowed me to play Jesus three weeks ago in The Passion. I was speaking about it on social media, and I felt that, like, fear of what happens if I come forth as an openly gay Christian? What are people going to think? Am I going to get a lot of um, pushback on that? And I did. I had a lot of people reach out. How can you stand for something that doesn't stand for you? How can you participate in a system that condemns and causes such harm to so many people? And the only thing that I can say is because I participate because of my own faith, my own trust in God, that he is or they are giving me this opportunity to be a part of something bigger than myself, to be a part of a movement that reclaims this faith for all, that's non-exclusive. And if that means sharing a couple of posts on Instagram or Facebook and just letting people know that, yeah, if you have questions and you disagree with me and you want to reach out and have that conversation, I am willing. If you want to reach out and just talk to someone maybe who's been through something similar, I'm willing to have that conversation too because I was desperate to hear somebody tell me that I belonged. And when I got that, it changed my life. So if I can do that for someone else and have it be a part of my career, the thing that I'm most passionate about, sign me up. Yeah, I, I agree with that feeling that people are sort of desperate for representation um, beyond uh, what has, you know, been the predominant narrative surrounding Christianity. 
And um, I'm really fortunate in that I was, my dad's a priest, I was raised in the Episcopal Church, it came out, no big deal, it was fine, everything was good, and it was only when I uh, was engaged that I faced my first rejection from my oldest friend. Um, she's been my friend since we were two, one of the first people I came out with, lived with us when her parents were going through a divorce, and I was totally blindsided. And it was the first time, because I was so privileged and fortunate before that, that I had to be like, wait, 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 wait. I was raised in the church. My dad's a priest. He, well, he went to divinity school. He did the whole thing. What am I missing? What, are you, what do you know that I don't know? Like, what's happening here? And um, it, it, through, that conversa through conversations I had about that with other friends, um, the, they greenlit this show called State of Grace, which is what I do. Um, and it's about exploring intersections that you might not expect with regards to religion in the United States. And so there is that. I was, I was surprised that people would want to have these conversations and sit down, that there would be a place for, again, a tattooed lesbian traveling around the United States talking to people about faith. And there is, I think there is this desire for people to have these conversations. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we're moving um, in a direction where we can see uh, a diversity of opinion on faith because unfortunately there has been just the, the same sort of homogenous hot takes on what it means to be a Christian. We've got to challenge that. You know, we have got to be this voice of compassion and radical love as we see from the example of Jesus Christ. He was not ambiguous in that. And I don't know why we sort of allow people to get into these positions of power that have these really, really not great uh, interpretations of what he was explicitly saying. Yeah, I also believe a little subtlety goes a long way. Just in the same way that uh, members of the community, LGBTQ community, have felt so hurt and damaged by the clobber passages. Like, it's not our job to go clobber people with how we think they should be a Christian or how they should lead. We can just lead by example. One of my former pastors gave me the greatest advice one time in a sermon because I was in that space of 2015, 2016. I was arguing with everybody on every bit of social media. I was posting things left and right, and it wasn't getting me anywhere. I was losing friends and family. I was getting frustrated and angry all the time, and I just felt a lot of my old insecurities um, from my faith journey being stirred up, and it felt like a personal attack every single time somebody would post something about that person. And one time in a sermon, our pastor said, listen, you can, it's you versus a million people. They have one opinion, you have another opinion. You, in your absolute heart, believe that is of Christ and that your opinion is the truth. You have two options. You can stand there and you can try to shout over those one million people all day long and see if you get heard, see if you can win that argument, but you're probably not going to. Or you can turn your back, walk the other way, and lead by example and see how many people follow you. And I've tried to remember that every time I don't need to get into arguments with people. I don't need to try to force anyone to believe because who do, what do I know? I just know my personal experience and what's been placed on my heart and I try to leave. I don't study the Bible. I'm not a pastor, but I know that I've been saved and I know that there's a purpose on my life. Uh, I believe that each and every single one of us was created with purpose and for a purpose. And sometimes when you get to that point where you just want to, you want to say something, but you hold yourself back because oftentimes as Christians we do that, that's when you need to go forward a little bit. And it might not be the way you think it is. It might not be by arguing somebody and telling them what to think or how to feel. It might just be stepping forward into a space where you allow yourself to be vulnerable and have a conversation and hear somebody. And that might be enough for them. They might see that, oh, there's something about that person. I don't know what it is. They didn't try to change me. They didn't try to tell me how to be. There's something about them that I like. And they might just try to be a little bit more like you, which might lead them into the church unexpectedly. And I think that's, I think it's a good sort of way to go about it because we don't have time to ar argue all the time. We don't have time to be angry and just post things on Facebook just because it makes us feel good in the moment. I, I used to do that and I would go and delete it a few hours later because I'd be upset with myself. <laughs> like, I'm sure we've all done that. Like, yeah. that's not the way to do it. Right. John, were you gonna say something? No, I was just gonna say part of the, 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 the deal is, is People who are persecuted or oppressed don't always have to be, shouldn't always have to be the ones in the defense posture. Mm -hmm. So as a cisgender heterosexual pastor, part of my job is to say, let me take some of that heat for you and let you go about the business of just living and, and, and breathing. So there is, I think allyship is important in that way. Sometimes you you're just want to be on the front lines of that. 
I'm going to get to questions in the audience in just a minute, but I'm going to start with you, John, and then I'd love to hear from all of you. What is one thing that you think Christians have yet to get right, and what should we be focusing on moving towards in the next few years? Um, the thing, well, there, there's nothing that Christians get right or wrong. There's just our individual right or wrongness, and so I think it's... Um, you know, I was with a group of LGBT, uh, Christian moms of LGBTQ children, and they, they're all in different stages of being affirming or not. Some of them fully don't understand at all. And one of the moms said, um, the day my daughter came out, it started the clock in my head on the idea of her being gay. Her clock had started 15 years earlier, so she'd worked through the questions, she'd struggled through the theology. So I had to start catching up. And I think what Christians don't do is they don't allow people to enter their lives exactly where they are and trust that they are gonna, they're gonna move, they're gonna evolve. We, are, we didn't start here we're, where we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago, very different, let's hope. I wanna argue with my former self because I'm gonna wanna try to grow. We have to give people a chance to grow a little bit. I, I totally agree with that. I, I would say um, what I would love to see more of is just sort of what you were saying of that of that work um, that so many of the members of the LGBT plus community put in um, to see some allyship um, or at least some open mindedness uh, to looking for those resources. So the onus and the responsibility isn't only on us to explain to you uh, those the different interpretations of those six verses, right? You know, I, I would really love to see people um, seek out a diversity of thought and opinion and of biblical theology because it's out there. And it shouldn't just be on members of the queer community to be the ones to you know, be sharing it and to be uh, sharing those resources. I think that we can agree, you know, this is why we're here today, that we do need to get better, we do need to talk about this. And it shouldn't just be on members of the queer community. Let's, let's try and work through this together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's gonna be uncomfortable at times, and it might be uh, exposing yourself to opinions um, that are unfamiliar to you. And I think that there's almost nothing, my, my dad always says, there's nothing more holy than just saying, I don't know. You know, I, I have, again, back to the tattoos, I'm sorry, but I have lean not on your own understanding tattooed on my arm, because to me, that gives me such peace. Um, there's a lot of, there, there's this boldness um, that, I, that I think is uncomfortable for me from the side of people that would uh, assert that they know for sure for certain what is right and what is godly and what is holy. And so I, I would just look forward um, to, to people being open to that growth that you were just talking about, John. I would say Christians need to work on self-love. And that's not a conversation that most people have, but we always hear this term, love thy neighbor as thyself, right? It's the golden rule, it's the, it's the heart of all Christianity, right? But the problem with that is, so many people can't understand how to love their neighbor because they've never actually taken the time to dedicate to loving themselves. And so the thing, and this goes back to my point earlier on sexuality is fluid, is, is fluid. It's, it's so difficult to love somebody who's different from you because there might be part of that difference in you. And it might not be the same thing, but there might be something in you that you've never fully had a conversation about that you've never fully accepted or owned. It could be your sexuality, it could be your weight, it could be jealousy, it could be comparison, whatever you have in, in your heart that's sitting on your heart. So it's impossible to love thy neighbor as thyself because if you don't love yourself, well, there it is, prophecy fulfilled. You're loving your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And I see that all the time. Uh, with my book, I talk about, um, I always have people um, speak a word of affirmation into their lives whenever I do book signings. I sign every book, um, uh, you are, and then I have them choose a word. And I always say, I want you to choose a word that at your absolute best describes the most perfect version of you. What would you hope on your best day that word would be? And I tell you what, that is the hardest question for almost every single person to answer. Every single, they always, oh, they ask their friend, oh, what would you say about me? Oh, what, what do you think I am? They can't say it. And it brings tears oftentimes, and it's difficult, and it's confusing for people, and I have to sit there and, what do you think? What do you think about me? I met you four seconds ago. I'm not sure. <laughs> but you've known yourself for 60 years, and you can't come up with one word describing yourself in a positive light. So I think that there's, there's deep-rooted problems in that. So it's easy to point fingers at other people and to judge something about others because it detracts from you. It takes the spotlight off of you. 
So I believe Christians, now more than ever moving forward, just need to work on self-love, taking time to just take care of yourself and reconnect and, like, love on yourself, to do what we're supposed to do on a Sunday, to, like, actually try to grow and love and accept Christ and just to kind of reset, you know? I think um, for me it would be accept that you could be wrong. There's nothing wrong with being wrong and having gotten it wrong. It's okay to question your faith. It's okay to wrestle with God. It's okay to fight with, I have had in my car screaming matches where I have yelled obscenities at God. At God! Where I was like, you don't give, you know, I was, all the Cuban came out, it was, it was, it was very, and, I'm, and God, and the thing is that God can take it. God can take, God, God doesn't need us to defend him. Like what Christians feel like we need to do. We need to defend our faith, defend how right we are. It's okay for us to question that because then out of that comes the real truth. Our truth with a capital T that nobody can tell us afterward is wrong. Or isn't, or is, or, or what are the facts behind that? I know. I know who God is to me because I allowed myself to doubt and ask questions and be wrong and get it wrong and fall flat on my face. And I think Christians are terrified of getting it wrong. If we accept the, the, the LGBT community, what, is that, what does that say about our beliefs, about who we are as Christians? What? It's okay to not know what's going to happen. That's what faith is. Yeah, um, to your question, and I think it will carry into my response. Um, when you asked that question, the first thing I thought, the most perfect version of myself on my best day, I am fearless. And what I would say is, I think that what a lot of us get wrong is we get so complacent. We settle into our little bubble, our community. If we have an affirming church, we tend to stay there because it's a safe space because we know that we are welcome there. What I'm learning is that's not enough. I have been trying every time I go home to get my family to go to their church with me. It's not as easy as it sounds because I don't fit there. And I am not going in a dress. This girl doesn't wear dresses. <laughs> so I'm there in what I thought was a very nice outfit, you know, my slacks, my jacket, my tie. And I noticed that my father seemed very uncomfortable. But he was the only one. And the more he saw me interacting with his community and everyone there opening their arms and accepting me, the more open and embracing he became. So I would say that what we get wrong and that what we can do better is to step outside of our comfort zone, engage with other communities that are outside of what we feel comfortable with, and leading by example, taking our faith to them. So now I want to open up the floor for any questions. We have time for a few if anyone. Yes, I'll come to you. Hey, hey thanks. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, just a question for anyone on stage. If you identify as a part of the LGBT community, what is, how is your queerness for you personally a gift? And what do you do to celebrate that queerness? Oh, please, I got this. <laughs> because I did not view it as a gift for so many years. Again, until I met this man right here, did I finally fully embrace it. Um, I, was, I played victim in my mind for decades, thinking why I used to try to pray it away all the time. Um, and then once I actually leaned into it, my sister asked me to pray it away, and that was a whole different thing. Uh, but for me... It's hard to quantify, it's hard to even put into words how my life has changed now that I've found the courage to lean into my faith, to speak about it, to write about it, to put videos up about it, to come to a church like this and have this sort of discussion. Um, it's everything. It's my purpose. I often, when I work with clients, um, I do some coaching, 
and I also go to like classes for young people who are trying to get into the hosting world to, to do what I do. And I always, the bit of advice I give to every single person is to tether yourself to something bigger than yourself. The, the, the big thing, the purpose of your life, because it should align with your career. I don't believe that the career should be out of alignment with who you are as a person and what you're trying to accomplish in this lifetime. I feel like it's all one and the same. And once you tether yourself to that big thing, because you will get blown off course and things will get rocky and it'll get windy and it'll be hard, but if you can be tethered to something down the road that you can slowly pull yourself a little bit closer to every single day, you'll be fine. And for me, it's God. But even beyond that, it's I was put on this planet to have conversations like this. I, when I went to Catholic school, I used to get threes on my elementary uh, grade cards. Threes meant unsatisfactory, and I would always get them in areas like stays quiet in class or works well with others. So I talk a lot. Like, uh, you guys have picked up on that. I talk a lot. Um, <laughs> I've known you for a decade. Do not start. <laughs> um, we both know the good and bad versions of each other. Um, but I used to... I, sh I used to shy away from that, and I was ashamed of it because I remember the nuns telling me it was a bad thing. But as I've gotten older and as I've leaned into my faith, what is happening, I'm a public speaker now, I'm a TV host. When I lean into these conversations, I get more opportunities to have these conversations. Um, so I'm tethered to something bigger than myself, something long-term, and every time I go do a red carpet event or I host a TV show or any, any sort of event, my prayer is always that God gives me opportunities. He creates opportunities for me to show his love and light through my words and my actions. Things that, that, that I want him to surprise me in ways uh, that are so abundant and so out of my realm of capability that I can only give him the credit. And every time I ask for it, the craziest things happen. And it blows my mind. So I, I know that for me, because I'm tethered to that thing, I'm always going to be fine, no matter how rocky it gets, because this city gets rocky, right? Um, I, to answer your, your question, um, I think be, having been born queer was the biggest gift God could have given me. It literally saved my mind to be able to connect with God, because the, the, the paradigm that I was born into and, the, and what I was raised with was this is what this is what the best that you could hope to do I never fit that paradigm I knew that I wasn't I my everyone was like you're going to be a pastor when you grow up and I was like absolutely not because I don't because I don't fit the, the the pastor the wife and the kids thing that's what I was born into but I knew that that wasn't I wasn't I didn't fit that I never I was never going to so it, it took a long time and it took years of you know like like I'm sure everyone here went through years of rejecting God and rejecting that notion and rejecting the church as, as, a, as a whole. And then because, because of that innate quality about me, but there was the duality of, wait, there is truth in what they were saying. And there was an actual connection with God that I've always felt from, from the time I was six. But it was my being queer that forced me outside of that box to look for where that connection led to. And that connection led me back to myself. So... It is something to celebrate, and and but just that's my boyfriend, by the way. It was Clark Kent, and 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 I discover things, <laughs> and I discover things about being queer with him all the time. Like I'm like, oh my god, I'm so gay. I have my diva. I have like pink is my diva, and I like I celebrate that. And like, and there's all these like different things that I'm like, oh, we're doing that super gay thing, and it's like, but it's like, I I'm like, this is something to celebrate. This is this is I. I earned my right to be here and own all of those different facets of myself. I've worked too hard to not be like, oh, I should probably butch it up. You know what I mean? Like that's, it, the, the, the differences were, were the salvation, were the, were the reason that brought me back to, back to one. Did that answer your question? I don't even know. Let's go to Grace and then we'll go to another question. Go yeah, I, I would just say that um, sort of like the, what you're talking about, the, the work is what I think, um, I celebrate, and um, part of, for me, what that was, it wasn't so much as coming out as it was a gender presentation. That was like a harder thing for me to come to terms with, and I, I knew how I wanted to present into the world, and I just fought against it because I just thought it was too 
much, like too much of a burden, but you know, you do put in this work. And then I think as a result of that, when you, I, I'm so comfortable in my skin now that I really look to bring that out in the people that I come in, that I come to meet, because it's not just a queer thing. It's like, we all really struggle with being comfortable in our own skin. Like whether it's like you're having a bad hair day or you're just not really sure where your style is. Like, I really think that that's so important with just being comfortable in this world because there's so many outside pressures. So a way that I try and celebrate my queerness is, you know, understanding the work that I've put in, how can I be someone that is encouraging to the people in my life that maybe are going through their own journey, that it doesn't necessarily have to be a queer thing, but just because of queer people, we do put in that, we put in so much effort that I, you wanna sort of pay it forward and extend that hand to other people who are working through things on their own, um, just about moving through the world and finding comfort. Are, are you good? I'm trying. He has to go be fancy at the Emmys. So I just want to make sure we get him out on time. Um, so we have two questions, Anna and then Deb. I'm going to get to you. All right, here we go. Hi, guys. Um, all right, so this is hard for me to say out loud, but it's something that I've been wanting to know for a while. I've actually spoken about it with her before. Do you feel that there is a difference between the issues the LGBTQ community are facing in today's America and people of color are facing in America? And as a woman of color, I, I want to know that. Like how you feel about that. I was actually recently having this conversation. A friend of mine posted on Facebook and asked the question, um, when will the LGBTQ community, and she specifically said the African American community, come together and support each other? And that was actually part of what my response would have been to why I am so proud to be queer is because as a young white woman growing up in the South, it was the closest I would ever come to understanding the discrimination that my brothers and sisters of color face every single day. Except for a long time, I was straight passing. And so I could walk into a room and no one would know my sexuality unless I told them. And so it was the closest I came to really understanding what it might be like to be a person of color. So what I would say is that we aren't there yet. We don't fully support the intersection of these uh, minority groups yet. But if we are able to come together and understand that, you know, I still, I still have a lot of privilege as a white woman I experience things differently from a young black man. If I can come to terms with that, accept it, and as you were saying, as an ally, step in and take the brunt of what my you know, fellow brothers and sisters are going through, that is how I can participate. Um, so I do think that there is still a gap, but I think that it's so important to make sure that we are reaching out and trying to step into these other communities and become an ally and, and participate. Um, because with all of the minority groups combined, we are a much stronger and louder voice. There's, a, there's, a, there's something about like when you're, when you're a marginalized community to go, well, at least I'm not them. Because then there's like there's like a hierarchy, there's like a totem pole of what it. Until you get to the to be the, the straight white man at the top, you know there's all these different hierarchies of what's better and what's worse. So everybody, so these uh, you know these marginalized communities are just like well at least we're not gay, well at least we're not black, well at least we're not the Mexicans, well you know whatever it is that, that everybody's like fighting for like Mexican crabs kind of pulling themselves up. When you really when you really stop to think of it, there's so much more of us than there are of the, the one you know the one percent sitting at the top. You know what I mean? And if there was, and if, and if, and if there's a way to get each community to realize we're so much stronger together because of our differences, because of what we've experienced individually, we can come together as a community. You know? Yeah, I think it comes down to listening more. I, I thought I was so woke. I thought I was like all these things. And, and, but I also know that I could be just a white straight guy. Just, you know what I mean? I, I, I get that, and there's a lot of privilege in that, and I understand that. So I try to use my privilege to help others as much as I can. And um, I told you we switched churches. We've been in another church for a year and a half, and I go to a predominantly black church now for the first time in my entire life. And this last year and a half, I've seen my life grow and expand exponentially in ways I never could have imagined. 
uh, we go to church with our best friends who are all strong black women every week, and then we have long conversations. We go to brunch, have a mimosa. I, have a, I usually have a Bloody Mary. I'm from Ohio. Um, it's like a thing there. And we just have conversations. And I've had to humble myself quite often because I thought it was all the same until I dated him for six and a half years and taken him to my hometown twice. And one time he got pulled over by a state trooper for no reason other than the fact that he was driving my blonde white sister's car and he's a black guy. And the second time we went home, we went to the county fair and they were selling Confederate flags the size of this room in Ohio, two states north of the Mason-Dixon line. So, and so once I started to experience that reality through my relationship with him and through my friendships, it, it taught me to sort of just listen a little more often and to accept that maybe you're not the most woke guy in the world and you don't, <laughs> you don't need to speak up for everyone, even though in my heart, my intention was good. I thought I was helping. I thought I was like, well, let me tell you what it's like to be black. <laughs> like, I'm not black or I'm not a person of color. I, I, I can't speak to that. But I can listen and then in moments, like the Wendy Williams show, I can use those moments to have conversations that maybe some people don't have the opportunity to have just yet, but will have the opportunity to have. I think that Christians or people in general fear minority groups because when you're in a minority group, you have to be 10 times as talented, smart, articulate to get half the opportunities. And if you're in the majority, it's easy to rest on your laurels and just kind of take things for granted and coast, right? I've experienced both sides of that. As a white guy, I was always kind of lazy because it was expected that I'd go to college, I'd have a great career and it'd be fine. But what I really, really resonated with was my gay side, my queerness. And that was always hard for me. So I've always felt misunderstood my entire life because as a gay man, Christians never fully accepted me. As a Christian, the gay community never accepted me. And all the while I'm struggling with this, it's not as easy for me as you think it is, right? I would have discussions about white privilege knowing that I benefited from my skin color, but also internali internally knowing like, no, I've had a really hard life. I've struggled with depression and suicide and these things my entire life because of my queerness. But I felt for so long I couldn't have that discussion because somebody else had it worse than I did. So, so I think to your question, it's not the same. I could, if I chose tomorrow to suppress that side of myself and walk down the street, I'm a, I'm a cis white guy if I wanted to do that. You don't have that option and you've never had that option your entire life from the time you were little. And also being light skinned, I'm sure has also been a whole different thing. In some ways there's privilege in that, in some ways there's a lack of acceptance, I'm sure, right? So I think it all comes down to just, again, having conversations with people and sometimes just listening to people and hearing, you know, learning something, taking on a student mentality. We have time for two more questions. So I have Deb and then right here. All right, here we go. So one of the best things that a brick and mortar affirming church can offer is to have a place of stability where people can come, you know, the rest of our lives is so crazy and the rate of change is increasing. But I can't remember who said the comment about, don't worry about bringing millennials into the church perhaps, bring the church to them. Can there be a quick conversation about a little bit more of what that could look like uh, for selfish reasons? Because we, we would need to know that. Yeah, and, yeah, and I don't mean, I don't, I don't mean the goal isn't to get them into the church. I'm saying that the goal is to go out and love on them, and let them then make the choice to naturally. One, it's like how I said earlier. I'm like, let people wonder. There's something about that person that's special. I want more of that. I want to be more like that. So when I say that, I mean, don't try to come say, hey, come to church, because if you're not in a space to receive that or even consider that. That conversation is never going to go anywhere. But if the conversation instead is, hey, what's life like for you? Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your, your experience. What's it like to be you? I think that's the way to do it. And you build trust and you build relationships. And then the end goal, sure, bring them into church if they choose. Or if not, the worst case scenario, maybe you 
make a friendship or you better somebody's life, life, and then they go have a conversation with somebody else and they better their life. And maybe that person comes to church, right? Yeah, I, I think also um, we talked about some of the unfortunate qualities of the human condition, right, to like put people in groups and create division. But I think one of the beautiful um, qualities that we all share is uh, an eye and a heart for service. I really believe in that. So I think uh, church creating service opportunities, in my experience, um, has been more instrumental in bringing people into the fold of a church community than just inviting someone into a church building. Um, because people, we, we do, I, I really believe we intrinsically want to help people. You know, we want to lend a hand to those less fortunate um, than ourselves. And I think finding opportunities that are sort of organic to invite people um, to participate in activities like that are really good at just introducing the idea of church, of like, oh, well, and where do these people gather sometimes? Like, well, sometimes at this address and sometimes in, you know, on Skid Row or wherever. But I, I do think that service um, is a great sort of entryway point to opening people up to the idea of really what it means to be a Christian, which is, and I think has to be serving those less fortunate than ourselves. Great. And here's our last question. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Renee, and <laughs> thank you, AJ. Um, I was one of the people who followed you from the Wendy Williams show. So, and I'm not African American, so <laughs> as you can see. So, I want to say thank you. Um, that platform that you, in which you created, you illustrated it quite well. And what made me follow you, and to be in in your pre in the presence of all, thank you, Lord, is to because you said, "Let's pray." You brought the word prayer on network TV that gravitated to me that I said, I need to follow this man. There's something special about him. And so therefore I've been following you. I purchased your book and you commented and as I was, we were relying, re, re, replying to one another. So I wanna say thank you. So it was the show, you used your platform well because I'm here. And two, lastly, it's not a question, it's more of a um, moment of gratitude to the panel. Um, the panel to sit in this audience to listen to such meaty conversations that we're privileged to today with a wise panel is such an honor because of my age and being raised Catholic, I've never heard these conversations. I too sat in there saying this doesn't belong to me. I ran from Catholicism as fast as I possibly could. I never held a Bible. I told a pastor once it's that never cracked open a Bible because I was scared to death that it was going to you know, start my hand on fire. Now I can't put the Bible down. You know, I just, you know, soak it up like a dog is to a bone. And I try to live my life in accordance to God's word, which is a beautiful word. But what to hear you guys, the, the common denominator is love and compassion and understanding that it's a world in which we participate in. We may be a minority, but we're the majority. And that's where the shift in my mind took place, where it's like I have a responsibility the responsibility is to do what you're doing, to be tethered to something bigger than ourselves. And who I chose to be tethered to is the Lord. So I want to say thank you so much for being vocal and being who you are. And you're all necessary. Each and every one of us is necessary, I have to say that. We all have something to give. So thank you. First of all, let's applaud him. because that's. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to you. Uh, the moment he's referring to is another one of the days I was on Wendy Williams talking about uh, Jesse Smollett, and I just said, I'm going to pray for him. And that's how I said, look, I'm just going to pray for him. I'm not trying to pile on. I'm just going to pray for him. And again, speaking to the conversation we had earlier, um, in those moments, it's a little bit unnerving. The moment I decide I'm going to say it, before I actually say it, it's a little bit like, because <sighs> you're on national TV in front of millions of people, you don't know how it's going to re be received. But that's, I mean... That's not of Christ, though. That's, that's, that's the devil work. That's, that's somebody trying to stop you, something trying to stop you from speaking truth. And I almost didn't write my book, and thank you for purchasing my book. I, I hope you've gotten something out of it. Um, but I didn't write it because I didn't think my story was important enough. I didn't think that my struggles were important enough. I didn't think I was worth it because I wasn't famous enough yet to share so how can I write an autobiography and a self-help book when I'm also still figuring things out and still learning and growing every day? If I wrote that book again today, it would be a totally different book than it was a year ago. You know, I, sh I opened that book sharing my suicide story. And so many are so much worse 
or so many didn't make it to where they could actually share the story. So I felt such deep guilt for even thinking I was important enough to share my story. And that's not true. It's just absolutely not true. And every single day, this is the beauty of social media, every single day I get messages from people about how my words have helped them or saved them or started conversations, they started a book club or something that I've saved lives. And that's all absurd to me. It's crazy to think that because my mind goes to, well, I'm not a bestseller yet. I get insecure because my friends who are celebrities, their book comes out in that day, it's a bestseller. And it was written by a ghostwriter and they didn't write a word of it. I wrote 78,000 words by myself with an editor and a publisher and I'm not a bestseller yet, but I know that I will be. And even if I'm not, it doesn't matter because if one life has changed, every time this happens, it blows my mind. I usually call, <laughs> I usually talk to him or I call my mom crying because it's so beautiful and it means so much to me when anybody who maybe has fallen from the fold and who's maybe gone astray comes back because of something I said or something I did it makes everything so worth it for me. Um, and I've been so blessed. There's so much of my journey that I'll never be able to share, but I'm gonna, I try. Um, that has been so difficult. So every time I step into a space like this, in an hour I'll be for two hours, I'm presenting an Emmy. I'm presenting at the Emmys today, which is crazy, which is why I'm in full makeup. I don't normally have makeup on my face, <laughs> but I had to switch my schedule and get makeup done early in the morning so I could come do this because I wanted to do this. Um, but every time I step into those spaces, I just pray for an opportunity to do something special and to, and, to, and to touch somebody's life. And if every single one of us can do that, because a year ago, I wasn't an author. Now I am. And now I'm an expert on something. Whatever, right? And so every single person in this room has the ability to impact countless lives. Just find the courage to share your story, have conversation, listen to somebody who might be different from you, and I think we're all going to be just fine. And then go out into the community and just love on people. Okay, this is the final, final question, but it's the pastor, so I can't say no to him. <laughs> call, it, call him That's pastor. all the time we have, people. Yes, <laughs> call him pastor privilege. So uh, as uh, Renee had said, um, we're so appreciative of you being here. Uh, as a cisgender, I appreciate your courage. I appreciate your courage for coming here, being in this sacred space to share your story. And that's what we are. We're storytellers. But yours is a courageous story that you've told. And thank you. I want to also, and also thanks to Melinda. Melinda... Uh, is also courageous in wanting to make sure that these stories are told through We Need to Talk. And so we are blessed here at Harmony for that to happen. I want to also address what Anna had said. Um, mm -hmm. and, and all of you have addressed, just so everybody knows, the United Methodist Church is bringing together the LGBTQI community and the people of color together in Minneapolis to discuss together the issues that are being faced so that we can have a better church. I am not about, nor is Rev. Kathy about, senior pastor at Hollywood UMC, we are not about the self-preservation of the United Methodist denomination. Okay? However, I want to look at John, and thank you again for lunch, sharing lunch with me and Melinda yesterday. I want to look specifically at you because you have been part of the Methodist church before. I would like to ask this final question for you. I'd love to hear all of your opinions, but I know we're time limited. What do you hope for the United Methodist Church now that we are at this juncture in our lives? What is your hope? Uh, the only thing I can say is that um, as I began speaking explicitly on matters of sexuality and race, that as a pastor, there was a tension that showed up. And I finally had a choice to either be an authentic or an employed pastor. And I heard God calling me to leave my church in the form of my pastor's voice saying, you're fired. And it released me to be say exactly what I needed to say. And my, my hope for the Methodist church is whatever happens, if it's implosion, if that's what's necessary for compassion to rule today, that's what I hope. I have no interest in 
preserving anything other than um, a love that endures. Amen. <laughs> Round of applause for Grace, AJ, Tennessee, John, and EL. Thank you so much.